God gathered uh, to be in your presence to worship you in spirit and in truth, to proclaim your glory until you, clum- uh, until you come again, to proclaim your gospel as well until you come again. Uh, God, may we always remember that you are the head of the church as we'll investigate and look at today. Pray for those who are ill, who are uh, having issues in maybe some relationships with finances, uh, vocations, changing of jobs, all of those things are going on in our body. We pray that you would direct and guide those, that you would give us peace that passes all understanding. We pray for my daughter and her new husband, Bryce, as they go on their honeymoon today, and uh, pray for safety over them as well, and we're thankful for the celebration of marriage that you gave us yesterday. I ask God that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. You may have a seat. For the next four weeks, um, I'm going to take some time. I was going to jump into a new sermon series that would be quite long. I think it's appropriate for these next four weeks that we speak about the church and the Christian's duty therein. It's going to be a short series on what uh, theologians call uh, ecclesiology, ecclesiology. Now, why are we doing this? Four reasons. Individualism is killing the church. I would put it this way. Selfish individualism is killing the church. Now, of course, the church cannot be killed. So that is a way for me to say that it is being damaged, that people are damaging the church through their selfish individualism. Now, it's because... We don't know the head. We don't know who the head of the church is. We think it might be us. Anybody wake up one day and say, I think I might be the head of the church. If so, please talk to me afterwards. We'll do some counseling. Uh, We rebel against its authority. There's authority that has been placed in the church by Christ, who is the head. And we tend to rebel or at very least sometimes disrespect the authority that God has placed over the church. And mostly, especially in the culture that we live in, we are disloyal and fickle. Both of those things are talked about in Scripture as being sins. Individualism is killing the church. Second, some churches have become synagogues of Satan. I would love to claim that I coined that phrase, but Jesus coined the phrase. Okay? Synagogues of Satan. It's mentioned in the Confessions of Faith, by the way. Some churches have become synagogues of Satan. We'll speak on that next week. Third, Christians don't take the worship of God on the Lord's Day seriously. The Lord's Day has become just another holiday. Christians, those who are regenerative of Christ, the elect of God, don't take the worship of God on the Lord's Day seriously. And fourth, this will be the fourth week, this will be Labor Day weekend. The mission of God is compromised because Christians are feeble, disloyal, and soft. It says in scripture that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. However, when you have feeble, disloyal, and soft Christians, the gates of hell may not prevail, but they certainly advance. So, I want to talk about individualism today. Um, Let's delve into it in some Uh, measure of depth the church this church I should say and many like it have something called membership now there is a debate on membership that uh, takes place on two fronts should membership even exist I would say even early on in our church's history membership from all the pastors around me just the church culture and uh, church culture in general Poo-pooed membership is not important. So some people ask if it should even exist. And if it should exist, what should it look like? Well, there are scriptural uh, concerns when you talk about membership, and there are also practical concerns. Uh, Let me uh, explain what I mean by that. There's scriptural uh, concerns like the gospel, okay? We have to get the gospel right, the good news of Jesus Christ right. The good news, by the way, uh, for some people is an inch deep, and for others who rightly understand it, it is a mile wide. The gospel is the good news of God from Genesis to Revelation. It's not just us praying a prayer and being saved. There is more to the gospel than that. It's the gospel of the kingdom. That's important when you consider membership. Also, election. Uh, Scripture plainly teaches that There are people 
Christians who are the elect of God. It says it in multiple locations. It talks about election. And there are scriptural concerns like election. Those who are saved and regenerate are the elect and they are part of the church. They are the universal church. We use the word Catholic in our Apostles' Creed, small c, not Roman Catholic, but just Catholic, meaning the universal church. There is mention of the ecclesia in scripture, the mention of the church. So we have to take that scriptural concern into, into, uh, into our minds and into our consideration of this. And there is also leadership and offices of the church discussed clearly in scripture. Those are things that are part of membership. You have to understand what it means to be part of the church, whether you believe in an official membership at the local body or the universal church as members, you have to take those things into consideration. There are also practical concerns, practical concerns. Um, deacons, for instance, in Acts were appointed to help feed the widow, to feed those who um, were more of the, the poverty stricken in the early church. Each church has practical concerns locally and administratively that they need to deal with. Uh, in the practical concern piece, most churches write up a membership covenant or a membership agreement, and the members of the local church are the saints. This is, by the way, from the London Baptist Confession of Faith. The members of these churches are saints by calling, visibly manifesting and evidencing in and by their profession and walking their obedience unto the call of Christ, and they do willingly consent to walk together according to the appointment of Christ, giving up themselves to the Lord and one to another by the will of God in professed subjection to the ordinances of the gospel. All of these things must be taken into consideration when you call yourself a member of a church. By the way, if you're a Christian, you're at least, even if you don't believe in local membership, you're at least part of the universal church and you must take those things into consideration as well. Now, under the prescribed biblical offices and the scriptures um, that speak of those things, churches are allowed to formulate what membership in a local church uh, will look like. These should be biblically straight up, straight from the text of scripture. They should reflect, membership should reflect biblical truth, or, and, they should be biblical by implication. In other words, you can read a text and it may not say it explicitly, but implied within it is what a member of a local church and a member of the universal church would look like. Now, we have a membership covenant, and I wanted to briefly go over it because some of you have signed it, and this is just a good reminder of what you have committed to as a member of the local church, and we'll get into some more of this uh, as Christ being the head in a moment. But this is an example of a local church taking straight up Bible and also implications of scripture and saying this is what membership in our local body should look like. Number one, we believe that believers should be baptized. You're not baptized unto salvation. You're baptized because of your salvation and in obedience to it, you are submersed or immersed if possible into and uh, proclaiming your allegiance to Christ and uh, proclaiming your regeneration uh, as a Christian. You should be baptized to be a member of our church. You should take communion under the direction of the elders. Now, if you are living in sin, which is unrepentant, you should not be taking communion. And the elders of the church, if they know of said unrepentant sin, will uh, make sure that you aren't able to take communion, pro prohibiting you from that. It's a very serious thing. But it's even more serious to take communion is uh, in an unrepentant sin or while living under unrepentant sin says that very serious consequences could occur. So baptism community, theological unity. You can go to our statement of faith on our website to know what our statement of beliefs are. We also ascribe to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. But there needs to be a theological unity in the local church. And as members, you need to uphold that unity and be a part of upholding that unity. There are character issues. There are uh, commands to spend time daily in God's word. 
There is a financial component to being a member of a church. There is a missional component to being a member of the church. There is a commitment to the community, meaning a relational commitment to the unity of the church. In other words, you shouldn't be a divisive person in the unity of the church in your relationships. Uh, very important, we'll talk more about this today, and this is where I'll segue more into the, the sermon. Uh, we believe that there is scriptural, biblical commands to be obedient to the authorities that God has placed within the local church body. We call those elders. They are placed over you. They are placed over you and given authority to, got to say it, it's a four-letter word, rule. Okay? They're, they're put in place. We'll talk about that here as we get towards the end of our time together. But elders are placed over you to rule over you, to shepherd you, and to guide and, and lead the church. There are other things that are practical, like serving in your local church, practicing hospitality with others. But my point is, each individual local church has been given the wherewithal to biblically define what membership looks like and then to apply said biblical text to understand practically how that can play out in the life of a local body. Now, the members of a local body are the elect. Again, another word that has some controversy surrounding it. You can argue with it all you want. By the way, our church is Calvinistic in our understanding of Scripture, and we do believe that God does elect. We believe that the elect of God are called to become members of a local body. If you're an elect person that is not attached to a local body of believers, you are not doing what God has called you to do. You are called as an elect, regenerate believer in Christ to be part of a local body of church. Now, both the Westminster and the London Baptist Confession of Faith speak on this. If you'd like, you can peruse those and you can look at the, the scriptural references, but they are there. Now, this is what I think. I think the elect of God intuitively know that they're to be a part of a local body of believers. You'd be surprised, though, how many conversations I get into, um, maybe not in this particular body, but with Christians who don't believe that that's important. When I was uh, uh, kind of cutting my teeth in ministry early on in my ministry, there were many people that said, hey, man, we're two or three are gathered. That's the church. That's my church. Well, it's not talking about your multiple personalities or the two buddies that you have over for wings to watch the early football game. That's not what a church is. It's a local body. It's defined in Scripture, in all of the confessions that are uh, theologically sound. And I think most Christians intuitively know that they're to be part of a local body. So what then is individualism? What is the individualism that is killing the church? Let's, let's say damaging the church. The church can't be killed the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus, as the head, will progressively grow his church and his kingdom. But what's damaging the church? Here we go. Treating the church at large and the local church like a Walmart where you go to get goods and services. When you don't like the options at one church, you know, let's say aisle five. Okay, we're in Walmart. Aisle five. I don't like the options here. You go to a different store. You don't like the options? Just go to a different store. Now, notice when you treat the church like that, you have become the head of the church in your mind, and your standards and your peculiarities become paramount. Mind you, there are good reasons that folks should leave the church. I would love to do a Q&A right now, like ask you all. What are some good reasons why people should leave the church? I've been part of churches where people left because they didn't like the color, literally did not like the color of the carpet. Strange. There are good reasons that folks should leave churches. And frankly, if you leave a church for those good reasons, that church should not exist. The reasons are so profound and so serious that they should not exist as a church if, in fact, people are leaving the church for the right reasons. 
We're not talking about those for the purpose of the series, however. We're talking about Christ being the head, and the elect are not the head of the church. This is step one in determining if you suffer from toxic individualism when it comes <clears throat> excuse me, to your church membership. The elect are not the head of the church. I, I beseech you and I plead with you to not consider yourself the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. The Catholic, small c, or universal church, which, with respect to internal work of the Spirit and the truth of grace, may be called invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, are, or shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. That is a direct quote from the London Baptist Confession of Faith. Now, why do we have confessions of faith? I can't get into that, and maybe sometime we should do a sermon series on why we have confessions of faith. Confessions of faith are very simple biblical truths put into categories that you can read and understand as a summary or as an exhaustive understanding of a particular subject as it pertains to the Christian life, to God, and to the church and how it should operate. I guarantee you the Westminster Confession of Faith and the London Baptist Confession of Faith were written by really smart, godly people. They are not the scriptures, but they point to the scriptures. So I'm going to quote some of those today to help summarize the understanding that Christ is the head of the church. And I want to look at a few passages, Colossians 1.18 first. The context of Colossians 1.18 is this. Number one, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Now, if you believe that and you trust that, then the second part of the context is all the more real. Jesus, as God, is the creator and is all-powerful over everything. He literally spoke, and the world leapt into existence. Um, once I decided to do a controversial sermon series, because I never do those anyway, but once I did, I'm going to talk about six-day creation. Okay? That, will, uh, that will be maybe my final sermon series, and then I will hand the baton gladly over to someone and get on my motorcycle or into my van and live the van life. Okay, I digress. <laughs> Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. And Jesus holds all things together. Now, the same God, the same Jesus that is spoken of in the context of this passage is also spoken of in verse 18 as the head of the body, the church. Now, notice it says that it's a body, it's a, a, a living organism. And the head of that living organism is kafale, okay, the Greek word for head. In this context, it means the superior one, the one over all, the one who causes others to be shamed is the literal understanding of the Greek word. He is so great, so powerful, so wonderful and amazing and glorious. Because of his greatness, everything else, when they compare themselves to him, is shamed. That is the kafali, a superior greatness to the rest of the body. Let me say that again. Jesus, the head, is a superior, greater being, person, God, than the rest of the body. Now, what is the body? Soma is the word. I've heard of churches named Soma. Ironically, I knew of a church named Soma that really did not consider Jesus to be the head, but they thought their, um, you know, kind of socialistic communist community was the head of the church. The irony of that is amazing, especially when they got that particular word from this exact passage. Uh, but the body, the Soma, is literally the congregation of, of Christ's slaves. The scriptures speak of slavery. They speak of it in the context of the Christian life as Christians, the regenerate of Christ, 
being slaves to Christ. You are purchased out of the marketplace, the slavery marketplace, redeemed by Christ to be the slave of the head who is the creator of all things. Do you think that's a bad deal? Th this is the thing, because of the myth of neutrality, you will be a slave to something. Would you rather be a slave to Christ, the all-knowing, all-loving Redeemer, the one who died for you, saved you, made you regenerate, caused you to be made a new creation, slave to him, or a slave to you? I, I think of it in that logical understanding. If I'm purchased out of the marketplace and redeemed by Christ, the logical thing to do, as it says in Romans 12, when it says your spiritual act of worship, it means the most logical thing to do is to surrender to Christ, bow down to him, submit to him as a member of a local church, as a member of Christ's church, as a, as a Christian, a regenerate, elected, made new creation, you are a slave to Christ. You are the body, you are not the head. What about Ephesians 1, verse 10, 22, and 23? Here's the context as we go into verse 10. It says that the church, the people of the church, are blessed with every spiritual blessing. You are blessed as a believer, a regenerate, made new Christian, uh, blessed with every spiritual blessing. Do you know what those are referring to? It's referring to your salvation, your sanctification, and your glorification. The fancy way of saying, Jesus saves you, Jesus grows you, and Jesus one day will make you perfect and holy in his sight and in his presence forever. Now, that's the first kind of contextual piece as we get into verse 10. You are also chosen before the foundation of the world. Chosen before the foundation of the world. Before all this leapt into existence, Jesus chose you, if you're a believer, a regenerate new creation of Christ. He chose you before the foundation of the world. You are thirdly, predestined yes we believe in predestination why because the words in the bible i i gotta admit it's that simple you can nuance that thing to death you can try to explain it away you can go read some german scholar you know that was alive someday and say ich bon schnacken bolachtan or whatever that you know uh, predestined adopted you didn't choose, God chose you. He predestined you in spite of your rebellion to him to save you and he adopted you into his family and into his church. Fourth kind of contextual piece as we get into verse 10. You are redeemed through the what? The blood of Jesus Christ. It wasn't a nice favor that Jesus did for you. Hey, I'm feeling kind of you know, um, philanthropic today, so I'm going to save you. No, he died on a cross. His blood was shed so that you could be redeemed, and part of your redemption is being saved and placed into his church. Gets us to verse 10. He has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and on earth let me say it this way at some point in human history the church will be united in him is it not united in him now because of his error no it's because of us it's because of our sin it's because of our rugged individualism it's because of our selfishness, our self-centeredness. We are not united in him as we should be or will be, but we will one day, the church, be united in him for the purpose of his glory and his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That will be an amazing day. 
it's not happening now. I think maybe one of the more divisive moments in church history, not because of the, the more conservative, theologically sound churches. That's been going on for 2,000 years. The, the most reason why we're divisive now is because we have embraced errors and theological inconsistencies that make us feel good. I'm going to talk about that next week. Verse 22 and 23 of Ephesians chapter, um, where am I? One, yes. All things have been put under Christ's feet. I want you to imagine someone coming. This is one reason why I, I don't like the whole new thing about some, like we need a king. Uh, I have no king but Jesus. I'm dying on that hill. Okay. But one of the reasons why I don't want like an earthly king other than Jesus is I can't imagine myself being under the feet of someone, like literally being placed under the feet because of the reverence and awe and respect I have for that particular earthly king. I could never do that. But guess what? God has placed all things under Christ's feet. I'd willingly do that. That's what it means to kind of be a slave to be a doulos, to be under the authority of Christ as the head of the church. All things have been put under his feet. He has the authority over all. Also, he has been given to the church to be the head. Kafale again, superior and supreme. It is his body. He owns it. It's his body. His, his body, body, his choice. choice. Okay. It's his body, the church. And in that body, he shows the fullness of him who fills all in all. You know what this means? It means the church shows Christ when it's following Christ. And Christ is completing it and providing fully for it. All in all means the whole of all we need. In other words, it's all about Christ. Let me go to Ephesians 5, 23, 27, 32. I had an opportunity to preach uh, or to do, I guess, you, you know, you present, I don't know, I preach the wedding homily at my daughter's wedding yesterday. Woo! Phenomenal. Like, what a joy. Uh, I, it was an incredible experience to talk about marriage as the Bible speaks of it and how it relates to Christ's relationship with his church. Marriage is related to the relationship of Christ and the church. Christ is the head of the body, the church, and its savior. Now, see the prior notes of maybe that you took, but it means he is the supreme leader who always saves who also saves. It's the unilateral work of Christ. Folks, I hate to burst your Arminian bubble, your unbiblical Arminian synergistic bubble. Well, I don't hate to do it. I love to do it because it's the truth of God's word. It's freeing. It masters the soul. Here we go. You don't cooperate with God for your salvation and you don't get God to change his mind. Sorry, Mr. Barber. I know he's listening. Not. You don't cooperate with God and choose God and make movements towards God and get him to change his mind. He unilaterally is the supreme leader who saves. He's not the supreme leader like the Caesars of the Roman Empire who in a whim would put people on a cross and you know, burn and light the streets of Rome or the streets that they built with burning bodies. This is the God who saves. This is the Christ who is the supreme leader, can do whatever he wants, all powerful, all knowing, everywhere all at once, knows the future exhaustively and perfectly. Okay? He also saves. It says that he is the Kyrios, the Lord and the ruler. He is the savior and the rescuer. 
He is the ruler and the rescuer. Now the church is to be presented to Christ. How? By Christ. Jesus builds his church and he builds it by his power in splendor without spot or wrinkle so that she, the church, may be holy and without blemish. You know what holy means? Dedicated to Christ. Okay, I, I get passionate about this because right now we're in the season. Uh, August is the season for church marketing. Keep your eyes open. You might get a mailer. I'm actually not opposed to church marketing in the sense of getting the word out that there's a church that is a good church that you should be a part of. What I am a little bit opposed to is marketing the church like it's a used car and selling it to people and appealing to their self-felt needs and interests. You know, you might see the marketing flyer come through. Look at our ministries. We have an underwater basket weaving ministry. We have a, you know, checkers and chess ministry. Nothing wrong with checkers and chess. And it goes through all these things of like, man, this used car is looking better all the time. I got to say, it might be a lemon. Okay, don't buy it. Check it out. That's not the church's responsibility to meet your self needs and sell you a softer version of the gospel and a church that meets all of your ministry wants and desires. The church is to be holy, which means dedicated to Christ, set apart. You, under, you know why this Sunday morning worship doesn't look anything like, like uh, I don't know, a, a concert or something else that you would find in the world that is appealing for right reasons. Like, hey, I love a concert like anybody. I went to Red Rocks and saw Sting and the B-52s. Okay? I enjoyed that concert. That's not church. The church is holy, dedicated to Christ, set apart, reflecting the perfection of Christ. It says at the end of this uh, particular passage that the mystery is profound, referring to Christ and the church. Matthew Henry said that Christ and the church are one, and the church should look and be like the biblical Christ. This is why I go into this. It has nothing to do with your felt needs. Nothing to do. When we come here and we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, it is in glory and honor of the Christ. He is preeminent, paramount. We come here to worship him, not get our felt needs met. But guess what? When you worship him, sometimes your felt needs get met. Sometimes your felt needs get taken out to the woodshed and spanked, okay? Like a narc at a biker rally, okay? Sometimes that happens. But it's not about you and your felt needs. It's about the worship of God, the head of the church, the superior one, the supreme one. The church should look and be like the biblical Christ. The church is not a social club or even a more serious organization that is run by people as the head. Christ is the head. He is the ruler. He is the authority. He is the definer of the church. He is the cause and effect of the church. And the church should be instituted, led, and governed to be Christ's church. All decisions by the elect and by the leadership of the local church should be under the rulership of Christ. Let me say this, how petty and small it is to choose churches based on preferences alone. How many ministries do they have? Are they the ministries that I want as I'm shopping aisle five? The length of the sermon, the felt needs, the wishes and whims of the immature and fickle. Let me remind you, I'm still going to claim credit for this phrase, even though I'm sure I didn't. Uh, invent it. Wherever you go, there you are. There is something wrong with you 
when you have petty and small preferences that guide you to go from church to church to church. Get a grip. Grow up. The ministry's length of sermon and felt needs, the wishes and whims of the immature and fickle are not how you decide to go to a church. Now, when you're going and visiting churches, you move into a new area, there's a time and a period which is perfectly understandable to visit churches and understand, hey, is this church uh, uh, know and respect that Christ is the head? And do they have biblical leadership? And are they preaching God's word? And is the worship dedicated to Christ? Or is this just another Walmart? Is this just another place where I can get my felt needs met? It's reflective when you have that type of petty and small preference-based mindset. It's reflective of an authority in the church other than Christ. That's why it's important. It doesn't uh, affect me as much. I mean, certainly it's, it's an interesting thing to watch from a sociological perspective. But what is inside? Not what is the outside discussions or words or preferences, but what's going on in the heart of someone when these types of things happen? It's reflective and authority other than Christ. Now, Christ as the head, this is where we go next, and we'll talk more about this as we go through the rest of the sermon series. i got to land the plane here pretty quick. Christ institutes officers in his church. Elders and deacons, primarily. Membership, you could say, some argue, is an office of the church. I think it's a station of the church. But elders and deacons are officers in his church. Acts chapter 20, verse 17 and 28 uh, in uh, verse 17, it says that the elders were called together. And in verse 28, it says the overseers, the elders, are to care for the church of God. They are called by the Holy Spirit, obtained by the blood of Christ, to care. And the word there really should be shepherd, which is to guide, help, and rule. Uh-oh. Guide. Oh, yes, please. I love bobblehead pastor on the dashboard of life, guiding me through my journey. <laughs> You're not laughing. I am. I, I, love, I love Pastor Helper. Matter of fact, I'm, you know, getting ready to uh, mow my lawn. Maybe he could come help. Okay. What about this one? Rule. You know, pastors have an authority to rule within the confines of Scripture and the understanding of what elders and their ministry is supposed to be. They are to rule the church. They are to be an authority in the church. They are to be a leader and a ruler as well as a guide and helper. <laughs> Philippians 1 verse 1. Overseers and deacons are mentioned again. The overseers are guardians. That's what an overseer means. And a superintendent. Deacons are servants, ministers. Ones who do serving uh, type of tasks. Much like they did in Acts chapter 6 in serving those who were stricken with poverty and did not have enough to eat. Those are the two offices given to us under the headship of Christ to rule the church. Now, what do the pastors, the elders do, and how do the elect in a local church respond to these officers? <laughs> I'm going to quote from the London Baptist Confession of Faith so that I don't get accused of saying this, even though I'm going to say it. Okay, here we go. The work of pastors being constantly to attend to the service of Christ in his churches, here we go, in the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay? Not your personal ministry establisher. The ministry of the word and prayer. Not your, you know, person that comes in, Mows your lawn when you're feeling like the game is going to be on any second. I need someone else to mow my lawn, okay? The ministry of word and prayer is the responsibility of the elder, the pastor, because they have to watch their souls and the souls of those in their care. They must give an account to him, the head. It is incumbent on the churches to whom they minister not only to give them 
all due respect, but also to communicate to them of all their good things according to their ability. So as they may have a comfortable supply without being themselves entangled in secular affairs and may also be capable of exercising hospitality towards others. And this is required by the law of nature and by the express order of our Lord Jesus, who has ordained that they preach the gospel and they live the gospel. Now I'm not talking much about the, the provision for a pastor there. But the church, those members, need to give them all due respect. Very difficult in the culture that we have today to do that, but you're called to it as believers in Christ, as members of a church. Acts chapter 6 verse 4 says that the elders of the church were devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word. Hebrews 13 verse 17 says that you should submit to your leaders. You should submit to your leaders. Submit, same word that's used in the marriage passage in Ephesians chapter 5, is to obey and yield. Obey and yield. No, here comes Joe Congregant. Well, what if, they're, what if they're telling me to do something sinful? Usually that's from someone who just doesn't want to obey the thing that's not sinful. They're going to find the thing that they think is you know, uh, sinful and say, they accuse the pastor of saying, hey, you need to obey and yield to me to a sinful, of course you don't obey and yield to sinful um, um, commands from scripture or from the pastor or <coughs> do anything that would be uh, sinful and abrogate the word of God. But if your pastor is being faithful to the word and faithful in the ministry and is not and we'll talk about this in gross sin. And we'll talk about what gross sin is. Not like, ew, gross, but like, <laughs> ma you know, major sin. Okay, You're called to obey and yield. So here's a few applications. And as you can tell, this series is very important. Very important to you. Very important to me, but it's very important to you to understand how you operate in a body of believers, the local church. Application number one, if you are the authority in your church, you will get what you always get because wherever you go, there you are. Some folks need to self-reflect. Some folks need to introspect, not navel gaze, but introspect. Who's the authority in my understanding of the church? Is it me or is it Jesus the head? Second, membership in a local body is required of believers. Now, I'm not saying that the membership, like the covenant is signed, so, but I would say that there was a role taken in the uh, Church of Acts. There was a listing of members in the Church of Acts. There was an understanding who is part of this body in Jerusalem or other places in that particular time. Membership in a local body is required of believers. Let me say an antithesis to that. Permanent Lone Ranger Christians are individualists looking for the perfect church which does not exist. London Baptist Confession of Faith speaks to this. The purest churches under heaven are subject to mixture and error. Okay, the purest churches, according to all the smart guys in 1689 who were smart, they were dialed in. They loved the Lord. They were good guys. They were good pastors and theologians. The purest churches, they say, under heaven, are subject to mixture and error. And then they go on to say this, and we'll get to this next week. Some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Ho, oh, uh, I'm going to charge admission for next week's sermon. <laughs> One laugh. You can get in free. <laughs> Nevertheless, Christ always has had and ever shall have a kingdom in this world to the end thereof of such as believe in him and make profession of his name. There's no perfect churches. Some are so bad they're synagogues of Satan. 
but the church of Jesus Christ will prevail. Uh, prevail. Third, application. There are good reasons to leave a church. Petty preferences is not one of them. Gross sin, and let me explain what gross sin is. Gross sin, as mentioned in scripture, would be heresy. Like open theism. If I start preaching open theism, leave. Evacuate. Run. Okay? Get out. There are other heresies, but that in particular comes to mind. I don't know why. <laughs> Disqualifying immorality and malfeasance. Adultery. Uh, uh, malfeasance with the books, the money. Gross sins in terms of those particular areas would be, if unrepented of, and even if repented of, still might be good reason to leave a church. Guess what? There's a process in Scripture to deal with those types of things. If you believe your pastor is a heretic, there's a process in Scripture to deal with that type of thing. If you believe your pastor is living in disqualifying immorality, there is a process to deal with those things. It says not to bring a charge against an elder lightly. You better bring the big guns. Better be well documented and have some witnesses, okay? But there is reasons to leave a church. Petty preferences is not one of them. Fourth, submission to elders of a church is commanded. Submission to elders of a church is required and commanded. And fifth, your Christian life is dependent on your active and obedient membership in a local church and submission to the head of that church and you are not him. Here we go, last London Baptist Confession of Faith. In the execution of this power wherewith he is so entrusted, the Lord Jesus calls out of the world unto himself through the ministry of his word by his spirit, those that are given unto him by his father, that they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience, which he prescribes to them in his word. Those thus called, he commands to walk together in particular societies or churches for their mutual edification and the due performance of that public worship which he requires of them in the world. Here's a passage that uh, supports that from the London Baptist Confession of Faith. John 10, verse 16 and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Your Christian life is dependent on your active and obedient membership in a local church. And frankly, um, I'm not going to argue about it. You can call. You can write. You can, you know, even send me like a brand new Jaguar with an invitation to discuss this issue. I'm not coming. Your Christian life is dependent on your active and obedient membership in a local church and submission to the head of the church, and you are not him. We're going to finish those last three in the next three weeks, and then we'll jump into another sermon series after Labor Day weekend. But there might be some confession of sin that needs to be made today. Hopefully you did it during our confession time. If not, now's the great time to do it because you don't want to approach the table of Christ in an unworthy manner. This is remembrance of Jesus. His body broken, his blood shed for the what? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. If any of this causes you to think, you know what? I think I've sinned. I might have sinned against my church. I might have sinned against the leadership of my church. Confess that sin. Make restitution for it. Maybe apologize in person to those that you offended or wronged. And make sure when you come to the table that you remember that Jesus Christ forgives all of it. It's grace and mercy. Let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> We are grateful for your communion table. It reminds us of what you did on the cross for us. And you know, what um, really is staggering, Lord, is that hard preaching produces soft hearts. 
there are people sitting here that have been here for decades, or at least the two decades or so that we've been in existence, that have heard the preaching from this pulpit for that period of time, and the fruit of their life is real. It produces the fruit of the Spirit. It produces joy. It produces a reverence for you and a desire to know that I am not he. There is only one Christ. His name is Jesus. So I pray today that we would get this accurate and straight. That we would understand what our role in the church is. And most importantly, we would understand that you're the head and what you say goes. You're the boss and we love you for it. You are the Lord, and we love you for it. You've saved us, and we love you for it. Thank you again for this table. Bless it in Jesus' name. Amen.